what is going on everyone we are live uh if there's a few people in the chat already looks like we've got a pretty strong contingent of people waiting to hear what's going on in the world of so rare as per usual on the end product podcast i'm joined by my sparring partner quinny and yo we have a very special guest in the building this week none other than the Penthes in the how building doing? how are you doing sir yeah good thank you very much um good to have you on yeah yeah excited to talk about the new stuff the a lot of the friends that I have in the FIFA scene don't give a damn about so rare. So it's good to, <laughs> good to actually chat to so rare enthusiasts about it. Get in with the nerds. Yeah, Definitely. that's right. There's a lot to get through this week. Quinny, how have you been? I've, I've been good. It's been a mad week. With also, we had the announcements last uh, yesterday. Celtic had a great game last night as well. And uh, yeah, overall, like uh, it's, been, it's been a great week so far. It feels like there's a lot of uh, upward momentum and a lot of different things. You know, NBA's been going pretty well. I've had good fun with that as well. And yeah, I can't, be- I can't believe it's really Thursday. It doesn't feel like a week ago, me and you were last sitting down, Stish. And I know. It's went so fast, you know. Because it feels like we were talking last week, we couldn't quite get his registration in time to play last week as Super Sub. But yeah. we managed to get uh, <laughs> we managed to get an EP in, uh, in time for this week. So it feels like it's just been like a shutter, you know, close of the shutter and open and here we are again. It's a new week and... We're looking at another weekend. Nepenthe, it's great to see you, by the way. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, nice good to be here. To jump into it, where do you think we should start? There's been a lot going on this week. Shall we get straight into the announcement of the new game modes and what is to come? The new sort of onboarding and all that that we've got going on. Who yeah, to off? I'm, down, I'm, down to, I'm down to talk about it here because uh, I think for me, a lot of feedback... I saw and had on my my stream and content was that this screws people that have been playing free to play with comments for like the last year and grinding them up. Mm. I just I just don't agree. I'm like, yeah, it's frustrating that you spent the last year in this that situation, but this is just way better for, for everyone. Like, okay, it puts everyone on an even playing field in that regard. But would you rather just carry on playing for a hundred rewards a week with like 400 common cards or would you rather enter five different draft tournaments every week and the chance to win multiple tournaments as a free to play yeah i can totally say i think that's the thing isn't it i I think depending on how and when you got into the platform some people look at the common cards as, as their collection whereas like some of us who maybe came into it to play the paid modes without really giving too much um attention to the commons We've never really thought of the commons as part of our collection. They're just kind of like tools to fill out training teams or something like that. Because I know, I don't know about you, but when I, whenever I enter like the casual tournament, I'm never really entering it to try and win it. It's more like, oh, you know, it's it's another team that I enter just out of habit. I'd, I'd never, ever really expect to actually yeah. win anything from it. I um, don't think I've ever been that close to winning anything. But I guess if you are a player who just plays the free-to-play mode, you might be a bit annoyed that you're gonna you're gonna lose your commons i don't know but you don't lose them you still have them right you just lose the utility on them so you still got that collection there um and i think yeah i mean i won one time in the common division which is still all right like it's better than better than ever yeah. winning but now it comes down to your football knowledge and what you put in your research your understanding of the scoring matrix of what teams are playing where and even in January with transfers and things like that. And they having that ability to have five entry points and, you know, Premier League will inevitably come on and it will be a part of it as well. So having that ability to have six entry points as a free to play user and all you need to get onto the paid ladder is one limited. Mm. I think, I think, I just think it's an amazing, amazing upgrade for them. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think as well, limited are so cheap at the moment and probably, you know, they, they probably won't go crazy, will they? Until, until we've got like, five million users on here all trying to get the same cards i don't see the limited market going absolutely wild so like yeah that entry point of like having one limited where you can maybe just pick up a decent scorer from one of the lesser followed divisions for a few quid to try and push you into those cards yeah i think that's really positive what about you quinny what what did you make of uh of these new modes being introduced i thought the uh, you know RIP Commons and all that, right? Good to have yous and good knowing yous and all the rest of it. But like, I think like they, they do allude to it in the article. So I do, I, I would, just, again, it's a small constellation, I suppose, if you've been a completely like free to play account. So I, 
I can only sympathise. But like for me, for the commons I've got, like the old ones, I can just get some sort of cool little thing later on when they upgrade this shop or some something that's different that no one else can have access to because I've been playing this game since how long I've been playing it for and the same goes for anyone listening to this. And I'm content with that kind of, um, you know, kind of vanity kind of aspect being upgraded yeah. and then those comments, because the comments have never been worth anything tangible anyway. They have always been just three items in the game. So as long as they kind of manifest themselves into like the coolest possible thing they possibly can for, you know, each, you know, if you get 400 comments, well done to you. You've got this thing, yeah. whatever they're going to make that no one else can ever have. I'm never going to have it. I never had 400 comments, you know, and that kind of thing, because like the the way they're moving in now, the way Net obviously is talking about it as well, well, like the five kind of funnels that they're building out with the draft system is that it's moving very much towards like a game now it's very much moving forward to being a recreational game and like when you move that way as well personal your, your personal profile your little banner thing that signifies you becomes more and more important more people will put time and effort into it and have any and have more levels of kind of care towards it so it might now sound like something a bit trite right but in like three or four years if you get some mad og like bunch of stars on your thing because you had 500 commons and they were across three seasons and whatever else that they decide to do you'll probably be quite chuffed that you've got that on your account and no one else will have it and that's like that will be a part of the experience to some extent so i don't mind it overall yeah i almost forgot about that the kind of like there was another mention in there wasn't there of the kind of club shop upgrades and stuff like that as well that i'm, I'm guessing like will become a little bit more of the experience for the the sort of like the free to play versions they mentioned um yeah there was a lot of like cosmetic stuff mentioned like changing the hub of you know your kind of manager page as well as being like the centralized point of everything and that's where they could be able to do really good things with both transitioning the commons into something that you could have that nobody else could have but also the club shop like you know, if, if you've got like a landing page and you can put like you know they must have so many rights to images and stuff now that are linked with leagues so if yeah. you put like a you know, Kylian Mbappe, like, although not an NFT, but like a unique Kylian Mbappe, like, design or something that nobody else could have because you're the person that got it. Like, that sort of stuff, it would be untradeable, but that sort of stuff could re really be, like, trying, trying to, like, I don't know, like, in my mind, I'm like, you know, those, like, photos, like, Spartan 11 photos where everyone's, like, you know, hugging each other. And yeah. then you could build, like, a kind of, like, characterized one of those on your landing page. And the 11 Ooh. that you've got, you get from the club shop based on rewards or commons that you've got, like things like that, that sort of stuff, I, I think, and yeah, that would be that would be fun. That'd be a lot of fun. And it would make it a game as well, more than like a paid tournament kind of like, you know, DraftKings system. It would be like, yeah, I want to win something this week because I really want that guy for my, my, my starting lineup picture or whatever it may be. Yeah, interesting that. I suppose as well with the advancements in like AI imagery and stuff like that as well that like the things that we can imagine might be possible with like creating some kind of image based off of your gallery or some kind of like position um, in the, in the division or yeah, like trophies, that kind of thing, like the trophy yeah, cabinet. Yeah. 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 That's quite interesting. And and I think like be interesting to get uh, both of your takes on this as like content creators as well. There seems to be quite a lot of noise from um, a lot of the sort of content creators on, on the platform from, you know, how we present this to an audience who like watch streaming or watch YouTube content. And a lot of, you know, like Quinny, like FC Barcelona and, and like, oh, is this the begin? Is this potentially the beginning of like branding your kind of club, if anything, to maybe like create some kind of actual excitement for viewership around and following of like, you know, like the road to glories and that kind of thing that we see. Um, it'd be interesting to see what kind of effect that you know like almost like the branding of your club landing page might have on on streaming and stuff like that i, I I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first yeah i think um i obviously i love the idea of road to glories so i was just chatting to Quinny before we started here and one of my main goals is to have a gallery that is entirely rewards and all i do is submit rewards to win more rewards and at that point it's like yeah like the, the kind of like passion of I've actually won something with these guys and having something like a trophy cabinet or, you know, like um, your own sort of like 
tier like top 10 list on your landing page of most decisives in game weeks and things like that and you could be like oh look at that i had mbappe for like 17 game weeks and he got 32 decisives mm. but look at this i've got this random like you know hearts striker or like shackleton <laughs> and it's like you know all of a sudden he's like pushing mbappe for that top spot of decisives over game weeks and just tracking your own players stats and things like that i think there's like in terms of like that whole you know that whole gaming and being connected to uh, a brand or your actual club as a club, I definitely think that's a possibility. And I, I, I like the way that they've done it now with, you know, their, you know, graphics and some of their wording was a bit hard to understand and interpret at first and has mm. to do a bit of digging and understand, like talking to Dan or reading the forums to see like what they actually meant. But it w- wouldn't it just be great to be like, like this is my five, for, like, you know, I've picked out for like a game week or three. And let's see what we can win from that and how this five have like helped the journey. But then I think the next step has to be having the ability to cement that in time and be able to look at that somewhere else like this without so rare data. You know, you can go back on so rare data and look at it, but on so rare, if, you know, if they want to be the all encompassing website, it has to be a, you know, remember when I won this reward with this five, where are they now? Click on them and see the journey that they've been through. Things like that, I think would make so rare it would give you things to do when there's nothing to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I think it's, uh, it's going to be super interesting to see how it all evolves, like, especially like from a user interface as well, because I think that all of these new game modes and stuff that they're talking about opening up for like the progression, like that 240 cap, 270 cap pro, you know, there was a kind of like diagram of how people might progress. And if you kind of visualize that in the current user interface, that, if anything, sounds like it's going to confuse it even more. Like yeah. way more tournaments on the front page, way more things in the way, limited, rare, rare pro, limited pro, all these things. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the dashboard and the landing pages like change. I think that, you know, there's not been a lot of hints towards what that might look like, but they just kind of mentioned that there'll be tweaks coming. And yeah, it's uh it's going to be interesting to see because that is a lot of new, there's a lot of new um, opportunities to play there. And it'd be interesting to see how many or people like us who play the platform already who aren't new users, what happens to cards getting used in some of those new uh, leagues? Do either of you see yourselves dropping it into those kind of like limited uh, pro or like beginner? I mean, I think a lot of them are locked off to people with, if I'm not mistaken, you need like less than 10 limiteds to open up some of those, right? For kickoff, you need to have under 10 of the scarcity kickoff. you're kicking off to, you know, like if, if that's the way to put it. I did a little, um, <clears throat> I did a lot in terms of like how confusing it might be or whatever, in terms of like the kind of layout for anyone who's already on the game, I did a little kind of translation on all the capped modes. So like the way cap 220 is built is it's underdog. That's basically what it is. So you get one card that's a dummy from the scarcity below. But I think it can score points now, but it's underdog basically. I found out that there was some kind of like hidden VPN running in the background on my computer. Which Abel is... Trader was trying to hack the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, was, <laughs> he was trying to get onto us, mate. So, you're going to wake up tomorrow, your gallery is going to be bare. It was just all <laughs> transferred for. That, that's it. So, uh, yeah, I started, like closed it down, and then suddenly everything's looking exactly how it does. So, like, I've been having problems with my internet here all week, and I just could not figure out what it was. and just looking at my like things that are running in the background, I had this like um, Zenmate VPN, VPN which I used to use, um, and it actually ran out recently. So I don't know if that's why. It was like my subscriptions up, so they're just giving me like some shit VPN in the background. It's like, oh, maybe you need to buy it again because it's uh, playing up. Yeah. But there you go. Close the uh, program and it just kicked me off the internet. So we're back, but um, just wanted to pick back up where we was. Net as you as we got booted off. You yeah. were making some good points about how cheap limiteds will come into play in yeah. modes. Yeah, ju- I mean, just in general, like I, I don't remember what my train of thought was there, but ju- just in general, like in spite of like the gallery that I have, which is quite a large, like I don't know compared to others now because they took away on sorry a day of the list to see how you know what, oh, what they- managers have what, which is a bit bit disappointing because it was like a, a way for me to like be like, yeah, I want to be like top two hundred gallery value and then carry on from there, but. Um, I, I love and I get way more satisfaction out of finding limiteds for like a free to play, you know, like, and then watching those and tracking those like on the road to that I've got. I bought two Amiens players for last week. 
and uh, one of them didn't play. He was out, and it was me not doing enough research because he was injured in the cup game in the midweek. And of course, there's not much info on that. But if I just googled his name, I would have found that. And it's that those little nuggets there that's like brilliant for content and for viewers, and to show people like this is why research is so valuable. If I bought this guy for three quid on an account that is a free to play where you know one few rewards from the global cup and all of a sudden he's injured he doesn't play in what was an easy matchup for them now they've got a couple of tough matchups he's worth like one pound 50 or something like that and i've got to take a loss on him and it's like the the emotions you go through with that for me is way more engaging than oh, i bought a rare for 500 quid he's worth 400 quid now i'll just wait it, it, i just have way less connection to it and i think going back to the whole it being you know, branding your club or, or being actually a part, feeling like you're playing a game with so rare. I think the lower budget side of things allows that a lot more because it's it's like relatable, I suppose. Like everybody can go through that with you. But when you know, when you've got like a hundred ETH gallery, like some of us here have, some of us haven't. But uh, it's like <laughs> it's just unrelatable. Even for me, it's unrelatable to be like, oh yeah, you can just go and buy like three super rare. Nice, I can't. <laughs> yeah. On, on on that subject of the hundred ETH gallery, like I look, I keep looking at my gallery, and it's like it's just it's ballooned over the last few years. Where, you know, I've never put that sort of money into something like this, but it, it's got to the stage where it is now. And I think it's ridiculous that some weeks, like with the sort of gallery I've got, I'm not competing. So I've been trying so, to slim down a little bit in that sense. It's like let, let, let me let me ask you something right. because obviously I get I get a lot of questions about like what what do I advise for new people coming to SoRare and stuff and. Like, funnily enough, Quinny told me back in week one that I started so rare that the mistakes he made, and do you know what I did? Those exact same mistakes. <laughs> I did the same stuff. I bought players that were useless, pointless, worthless, like didn't do enough research and, and ended up with, you know, a whole bunch of trash that having to farm off to Pavel for like, you know, one-tenth yeah. the, the price that I bought it for. How, how, what mistakes did you make and how do you go about with a gallery that size, because I look at my gallery sometimes and think, do you know what? I might just sell my entire gallery. And start again. Yeah. And just start again. Because I think with the knowledge I've got now, I think I would be better. And I see some people with like eight or 10 ETH galleries who have just got two lineups and maybe a couple of spares and they just clean up. And they yeah. you know, winning tier twos, tier ones every week, sell them off, withdraw the money. And once you get to free rolling, which I, I assume you might be free rolling already, but once you get to free rolling, it's like, that's a dream, isn't it? And at that point, you really just don't care. Yeah, it's a good question because I think I definitely made a lot of probably the same mistakes everyone did. I think my first few weeks on So Rare was buying cheap cards that I so I could play the game. Um, so I bought quite a lot of Asia cards that were in and out, in and around squads. I wasn't really using So Rare data as much as I should have been to see who is actually playing. I was just kind of going off like the L five or something like that, like trying not really doing enough research. Um, and then I got a bit better at it. But I think that my worry initially was, how do I sell up if I if I want to? And the realisation hit that no one's going to buy these like random Asia cards off you. They might buy the PSG cards. They might buy the Juventus or whoever it was that were about like players they recognise are more like easily, e easily sellable. Even though they're worth more money, you're more likely to be able to sell them, um, wh whether it's at a loss or at a profit. So I started buying players that I started looking a little bit more than at youthful players. So some of my early purchases were like Florian Verts and a few other players that I knew were going to be the next big thing. So I picked up like Verts and Musiala and a few other players like a couple years back. Um, Verts, I think, is now. And I picked up a Cruz as well, Tony Cruz and a few players that are like better quality. Lukaku was another one I picked up back then and. I just thought, you know, I'll be able to sell these. And I think that was one part of it, which which did mean that I had to put a bit more money in, but I felt a bit safer, if that makes yeah. any sense. It's like putting a little bit of money in that I'm never going to get back versus putting money in that I should be able to get back if I want to get out. It felt like a payoff. It was like, yeah, all right, put more money in, but you know you can get out when you want to. So that was one of my early learnings. And then I think now, similarly to the point you just made, there are people out there who have... A, ma a gallery that has like a really high value but maybe only has 20 cards in it but they win all the time yeah i've got a gallery that is currently estimated at about 80 something eth which is nuts but i don't i don't guarantee a win every week i i have good weeks i have bad weeks last week i won a 
couple of tier ones, tier two super and a limited. And that for me was a massive week. But there are definitely other people on the platform who have a gallery half the value of mine, but they only enter like two or three leagues and they clean up in those leagues because they've got an Mbappe, um, you know, a Veerman, uh, I don't know, whoever they've got. But they're yeah. the players that you need in that division and then they don't have any fat and I've got a lot of fat but on the on the flip I think that the way that I have played the game is partly why I'm in the situation I'm in now and I think that it's a short-term bad situation to find yourself in if you're a short to mid-term player you will find yourself running to Pavel to quickly get rid of someone who's maybe going to be out for three months to buy someone that you can fill it in with and I think if you've got a small gallery you kind of need to do that because Otherwise, you're stuck. You know, you can't field lineups or whatever. With with me, I think the gallery is where it is now. But a lot of the fat, if you like, are players that I've bought with the sole intention of sitting on them until they come good. So they're like, you know, like young sub goalkeepers or youngsters or players who are out injured for another few months. And it's like looking at those values going down, like as a whole, you're like, oh, you know, my gallery's a bit stagnant at the minute, or I'm not getting the success that I want. But if you zoom out, it's like if I look at my gallery's value over sort of like the last two years, there are like actual patterns. And a lot of those patterns are to do with the time of the season. Yeah. All those kind of like cycles that happen. And what we're in right now is looking back at my two year, the two years I've been on the platform or three years, whatever it's been now. Um, this time of year is always really bad time to sell your European players because people are looking to bring, bring in the Americans, the Asian players, all that kind of stuff. So I would say one thing I have learned is if you can afford to be patient, do it. And I sold a few cards this week at a loss and I don't like to do that, but it, it was almost like I stopped myself halfway doing it. I started reaching out to some of those like accounts that buy up the bundles and stuff. And they were like, oh, you know, I don't really want to buy the super res. And I'm like, well, the super res are kind of the bulk of where the money's going to come from if I can shift them. Yeah. So it was like, it was like, I'm starting to sell all these cards and I'm going to accept a loss. So what I did was I went back out of those deals and just listed them at floor price. Um, and I've sold a few of them. I made a mistake selling a Quentin Merlin forward card. I listed at floor, not realizing that he has midfield cards on the platform. I'm like, Oh. That should have sold for maybe an extra 50% of what I took for it. Although, unbeknownst to some, he came off with what looked like a pretty bad injury in the last game. So he'll, he got away with it. <laughs> he'll probably get down yeah. to that level. That I, like, I sold him at the price I did probably too early. He's probably then, worth a bit more. But and, you know. and mo moving on to like what the news yesterday. Yeah. Because I have a gallery not quite as valuable as yours, but similar in... You know, I don't really have too many stars. I've got a lot of tier ones, tier twos, tier threes. Yeah. With the new capped modes, is that possibly better to have awesome. matchup options yeah. and be able to go in and out of injuries and suspensions rather than having like just being able to play the like the all stars and the regional modes? Because in the cap modes, two forty and two seventy give you a higher scarcity reward, and mm. if you finish podium and get the higher scarcity, you also get one of the same scarcity. So now all of a sudden, like I kind of like change my outlook of like trying to sell a few of my misfits because i'm like actually they could be really good True. in a lower cap mode yeah this is this is part of it i've kind of caught myself halfway doing it yes yesterday when when i sold that merlin and i saw the mistake i'd made i was like have i just rushed into this and i think that i probably did a little bit because i just started looking at my gallery and i'm looking at other people and what they're winning and i'm like that's that's the diff that is another strategy. It's not the strategy I'd applied up to this point. And I have been profitable. So like it's not like I've been playing badly. I just I'm playing the game differently. And I think like you mentioned there, looking at those cap modes, it's hard to know how useful or not useful some of these cards I'm holding on to will actually be. And I think, yeah, I, I've definitely got some of those pieces where they might have a stinker one week, but next week they'll be good. And then there's a few of my cards, a few of my good cards, unfortunately, have moved out of covered leagues into like um, the Saudi Arabian League yeah. and the Greek League. And I'm like, oh, do I sell them at a loss or do I just sit tight? Because in the next six months, we might get coverage for the Greek League yeah. and the Saudi Arabian. And that's where people like Pavel make their money. Yeah. So I'm just selling into him to then like realize that six months later, that card's worth double what I let it go for. 
and I could probably have done with it for the utility as well. And then you just can't get it. Yeah, so maybe, yeah then you're trying to pay like four times the amount to get it back. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd be very surprised if the Saudi league didn't start getting covered very quickly. Yeah, like Ronaldo has made yeah. waves over there, and this a few other it. players are looking to go over there as well. And there's already a few good players there, you know, there is, yeah. and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I, I would be shocked if the Saudi league doesn't get coverage really quickly. It's got the Opta coverage it needs, apparently. Um, yeah. We, I've seen a few chats on Twitter that it needs level 13 or above, and people have listed, you know, like the Australian A League, the the Saudi League, the uh, I think it's like the Swedish League. There's a few divisions that, and I've, I can't, I might have even been yourself on John's podcast talking about, you know, they might that obviously costs money, therefore they need to kind of like sign a license with at least one or two clubs from that league to make it sen- make sense to pay for the yeah. coverage. Yeah, and I never really thought about that point before because I'm always like, well, why have we got Ukrainian cards that aren't technically covered in their division? And it's like that went probably the other way. Is like, oh, you know, we got the license to sell cards, but the the money they'd have to pay to cover the entire division is more than the money they'd make from selling the Shakhtar cards, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you made a really good point there, and I think, but this is a global game. We've seen how many leagues just open up almost at the drop of a hat one license for like the croatian league one license for the swiss league it, you know we, Af, Af, the athens clubs in greece um could open that up quite easily and now with ronaldo um in 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 saudi arabia how easy would that one to be pick up to pick up if you can mint our nasa cards do you know what i mean it's um it's one of those things isn't it it yeah it, it's gonna happen so i think patience if you can aff- this is another thing though is like can you afford to be patient? I don't like putting that much more new money into the um, into the platform at the minute because there's already way more than I'd have ever put in. But if you're starting out, you know, that's the big payoff, isn't it? Is like when you do get an injury or a player leaves the platform for a team that's not covered or whatever, then, then what do you do? Do you put more money in and buy a player to fill the holes or do you sit tight? And if you've only got a gallery of like 15, 16 cards, you probably can't really afford to sit tight because you'll struggle to get games out yeah. of the teams. So it's a really, it's a really interesting one. And I think like that's where, that's where we were fortunate getting in early when we did, because the gallery values just ballooned at a rate that allowed us to sort of comfort to like sit, even as uncomfortable as it is sometimes to look at the, the value of what we're holding, you know, we didn't put that money in there. It just the the platform oh, progressed. And definitely speak for yourself. I'm I'm a massive fear loss at the moment. <laughs> like I think, my yeah, ETH is about there or thereabouts. But yeah, because ETH has tanked my uh Yeah, this is yeah, it. Um, I think my, my realized I don't have I haven't realized any of my uh, all of my um what's the word profits yet. But the value the value of the gallery exceeds and like my trade in, but I haven't sold enough to cover everything that I've I've put through apparently. But um, yeah, there's some interesting tools on so Red Data that allow you to look at all that. But but yeah, I think those are the some main takeaways for me. Yeah. But I feel I like with the cap mode, like it definitely does uh, enhance the ability to carry a squad, and it makes it much more worthwhile. Like tier twos and tier ones get much more of a purpose. And like I was looking at it, somebody brought this to my attention in the um, in the, the FC Barcelona, and that's my, my wee member section, but. Uh, and it's like 45 goalkeepers is what you would need if you wanted to play in every division now, you know, <laughs> across all scarcities, 45 goalkeepers. Obviously, we're talking about all the way up and down, you know, but that's a, that's a lot of teams to carry. And I don't suspect anyone is going to be anywhere near doing that amount of lineups. So, like, I think particularly the, the kind of the higher up the, the mountain you go, you know, rare, super rare, unique, there's going to be much less I think competition is just going to be much more widely spread than what we've seen. Particularly at Limiteds, we'll probably feel a big relief from that when all these leagues come in and stuff like that. Mm. Iron Stacks are going to chase down VIP tickets and stuff like that and whatever. But I think uh, carrying a squad to now, you've said it perfectly, Stish, if you can afford to be patient, please do, because there will be, you'll open up some of these game weeks and you'll probably look at cap mode 220 on whatever yeah. scarcity you look at. And you look at it and go, they're paying out 50 cards. There's only 90 people entered. And I've yeah. got that guy playing in goals. And I've got that striker. And you're like, bug it out. Why not? Let's go for it. And yeah. it'll open up way more of those avenues. Whereas now it's kind of like, 
okay, they're paying out 100 rewards and there's 10,000 people there, but only 9,000 people are here, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> maybe I've got a better shot over here and it's not quite the same, like, oh, I've got a jet, oh, by me making a decision, I've got a totally different potential outcome for the better. You know, there's less of that available at the moment, um, which makes Cat winning. Cat modes offer Tier like uh, the ability to actually stack your favorite team mm. without having to have Mbappe, Neymar, etc. Because like, you know, Celtic rotate a lot, but you've got so many L15s that are low. Yeah, you might have to suffer with Joe Hart and having his L15 in there. But yeah, you could do like a cap 220 of you know, Bayern and just put in one or two half good players and then two of the other guys that don't particularly score well. And then if Bayern just smash your cap 220 Bayern stack is going to pro you know, probably win the whole win the whole lot. And that opens up again a lot of like possibilities of people joining the site and having fun because you could go and buy your whole 11 that you love from your club and then just pick based on what, what players fit in the cap. But if, you know, Arsenal got Man United this weekend, I wouldn't play an Arsenal lineup. But if yeah. Arsenal are playing against... I don't know, like, you know, Southampton or something, all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, do you know what? Let me get my Cap 220 Arsenal team, put them in and, and hope that I've picked the right ones. It's a good tactic. I, ne I never thought about that, but now just hearing you say that, I think a good, like, tactic for these Cap modes would be to buy two stacks. One at the top end of the table and one sort of mid-table uh, stack, if you like. Five players from both of those teams. You know, use use the top table team when they're playing the lower lower teams down obviously and use that mid table team when they've got favorable the thing with the mid table teams is they'll get spanked one week and then they'll do the spanking or follow yeah and that's what you need in that cap mode isn't it those players who can go from an l15 of like 45 but score a 55 on a better week um and that is where the depth is really going to come in in these cap modes i think and we see it with basketball I don't. Um, I haven't not reinvested too much into basketball. I've got enough pieces there that I can field maybe three lineups in limited and one in rare every week. But on any given week, sometimes my limiteds will absolutely bang in like contender because they'll have like, oh, someone's injured, so this kid who's awful who I won six weeks ago is now likely to score yeah. ten points instead of zero, and it's like yeah. this is going to come into play a little bit more in football. So um, I think. It will definitely be a positive thing, especially for limiteds where people trade in and out of cards a lot. Yeah. Um, but in rare, it might be like holding on to those cards who maybe are those rotational pieces, you know, players who come in off the bench, but then there's an injury and they're going to start and stuff like that. Though yeah. Having a few of them is definitely going to be the key. Um, and obviously, like I mentioned Verts a minute ago, but he's obviously got a zero at the moment. And uh, yeah. And, and there, there are so that that's where that's actually what I was looking at for that 50p player. I was looking at a guy that was like, had, like coming back from injury, used mm. to play, scored well, is on zero. But it, it's easy with players like Verts or Allaire or Royce yeah. because you know they're going to step back into that team, and there's so much information out there that you know when they're going to step back into that team. Yeah. But those players that play for the lower table or from the obscure leagues, they might come back from injury and sit on the bench for three years. Like you just don't know what's going to happen with those. So. There is a few cheat codes that have the the only upside potential, but I think otherwise you're you're taking a big risk putting like some random guy that might play, but if he doesn't, you've got zero points, and then you don't know if you want to put him in the next week. And as soon as he plays that one game week and his L15 goes up, he's toast now. You know he's he's pointless. So yeah, I I, I think the the verses and stuff are nice, but I definitely think uh, for my strategy anyway, I, I like the idea of fullbacks or you know we were talking about it earlier Quinny, yeah. about the strikers when they don't score they don't score points i like getting the fullbacks that are very decisive and and the strikers and possibly the goalkeepers as your guys and just know more often than not i'm not going to win and i'm not even going to hit like a good score because these guys are going to drop sinkers but when that week all comes together i'm going to win and it's going to be amazing like that's what i'm looking for out of the the new kind of cap modes I'm excited to see the prize pools for the cap modes. Yeah. Aside, like from obviously hitting the E thresholds, it's going to be really exciting to see what kind of players you can win because it's not just the money that could be won, it's the cards as well and the value of those. So it's going to be really interesting to see because I think if those pools are good, a lot of the sort of top tier cards will find their way out of the regionals, you know, like the Champ Euro pros and stuff like that. Um, so it'd be interesting to see yeah. how they balance the prize pools to try and tempt 
some of those better cards into the cap mode rather than like everyone trying to sort of just flip. I, I do I do think it was important to to introduce way more competitions as well because a, f- a few months ago, I might have talked to on the last podcast, we had Quinny, but something I've chatted to uh, Chani and Haber and stuff about a whole bunch is that the more teams and the more leagues that you license, the more worthless a lot of players become because now you've got Guerrerians and Cessinias and all of these like elite scorers and there's way too many elite scorers which makes all of them have less value. So having way more places to put them is going to give them way more value because now all of a sudden, you know, your your PSU fans and all the kind of like top players of SO5s, they're not going to be happy with one Carlos Hill. They're going to want three or four because he really suits the bill in multiple different areas, mm. which is just going to bring the price of everything up. And all of a sudden it puts you in that kind of positive cycle then again of even winning a tier two or a tier one has grand value rather than, oh, it's a, oh hopefully this guy starts. Like, I literally won a tier two last week rare it's like four quid wow a rare yeah, yeah rare yeah it's like it, oh. he, do, he, he looks he doesn't look like a football player either it looks like a cartoon character <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> like he, his last sale was four pounds and it's like that he plays wow. so when the cap mode comes in he might shoot up to 20 30 40 quid but yeah the all of these more all of these modes and and the fact that the markets right now are quite stable i feel like i feel like they've corrected to a nice area I just think uh, it's it's a really good spot for so rare to be in. Do you see him, Quinny? Yeah. Sebastian Nacrin or whatever. Yeah, mate. Doesn't he look like a character, <laughs> a cartoon character, man? <laughs> he looks like something. I'll see if I can put this on the screen. That is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking as well, selling some of the recent rewards I won in, when I, in, in this sort of like flash sale that I had in a week. And I was well surprised at how cheap some of the rares oh, were going. It was a tier three, big part on the floor. It was a tier two, my it? bad. But yeah, it's... It, a four pound rare is amazing. Like it, it was hard to find a good rare for like 40 or 50 quid not that long ago. So, you know, the, the barrier of entry is lowering a little bit. I think a lot of that is to do with the market cycle. Like I said, the time of the season, all that kind of thing. But overall, I feel like most of the recent um, announcements have been taken pretty positively by by all of us. I think one thing that I will pick up on that a lot of the players who hold Asia cards have um, voiced their opinions on is the new time of which the the lock uh, is taken for um, for your lineup. So at the moment on UK time, that's 11 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday and a Friday, isn't it? And I think yeah. it's going to change to 3 p.m., which, not, which won't affect that much in Europe, but it will affect... Um, Apparently, quite a few Turkish um, fixtures, um, particularly Korean fixtures. And it'll also mean that some of the J- Japanese fixtures, as well as the Korean, will split in yeah, so, a game so I, and half. I had a detailed look at this. I had a discussion about this on Twitter and on my stream yesterday. And yes, it's correct. It does impact 11 of the 33 game weeks in the K-League. But sometimes there's only one or two games impacted not mm. the whole cycle. And based on last season, the actual difference between how many were impacted last season versus this season, it's the same. And what I think people are missing out on the most is, I, I like, I get it, right? It does favour Europeans. It does favour mm. Europeans. But the first impacted game isn't until the middle of April that was a weekend game that now becomes a midweek game. And the first impacted game that is a double game week doesn't happen until the 5th of May. That gives people a lot of time to organise their gallery and prepare to get out of any assets they might have that are now going to be impacted by that. It's not that big of a deal, in my opinion. Yeah, I I looked at it as well, because I have quite a few Korean cards. And when I saw a lot of the noise on Twitter was like, oh, it affects 11 out of the 33 game weeks, I thought, well, that's awful. That's like two thirds of my utility gone on some of my better cards. And I got the fixture list up and I literally went like fixture through fixture. Look at that. Like (laughs) I went through the 33 games that are like already. Look, look, my screen's like, no, I've lost me. uh, There There we go. go. Back in the room. Uh, So I went through all the 33 fixtures. And as you said, 
in terms of them being impacted, yes, they are. There are 11 game weeks that are impacted. But in fact, the impact is not that they won't be covered or they get a double game week. It's more that most of those means that the game week will be split. So like two or three of the fixtures will be on the Friday, which means that they'll land in the midweek previous. Yeah. And then the other two or three will land on the weekend. And initially I thought, well, that's not too bad. So long as I've still got utility for those cards, there are three game weeks where there will be doubles. And yeah. the team that is most hardly hit by this is Pohan. They're going to have a minimum of three double game weeks. And this is before we've had any uh, ACL fixtures announced. As yeah. well, by the way. So Pohan are going to lose three. Olsen are going to lose two. And they're definitely going to have ACL fixtures as well. Um, who else was it? Suwon are going to lose two. And then there was like three or four teams that are going to lose one game each in a double game week based on the fixture list that is existing right now without any changes happening. Obviously, with cancellations and postponements, we might get more. But um, it's it's like, that's not too bad. But one person pointed out to me, I didn't think it was bad, but then I I oversaw the point that they made that if you've got, say, like one or two goalkeepers or just like one and a backup, and then your team's playing on the Friday morning, then the rest of your outfielders are playing on the Saturday. You can't field a lineup on the Friday because you've only got a goalkeeper and no outfielders. And then on the weekend comes, you've got a no goalkeeper and four outfielders. It's like, ah, and then we think about that. Yeah, and, and I do get that. But that, that and and that, that's where what I kind of like mean by like, you've got until April and May until this actually impacts you. The first sort of like, mm. like I think the first three months of fixtures yeah. aren't impacted at all. And I didn't quite get through more than just a couple of game weeks uh, for last season, but last season also had multiple double game weeks and multiple yeah. split game weeks. So it's not like it's new; it's just different. Like I, I bet if the, the person that made the spreadsheet that I saw, I bet if they went back to the old timetable and did the exact same kind of like setup and experiment, they'd find that there would still also be a whole bunch of doubles and a whole bunch of splits for the midweek. So I, I don't think it's a huge, huge issue. Um, I, I, I do agree with PSU fans in one, one regard, though. It's like they've made a fire to put out and it almost wasn't worth it. It, it almost was like a... Like, I, I love the fact that it's going to be 3 p.m. because the amount of times at, you know, 11.15, 11.30, I've got some news and I'm like, oh, crying out loud. Yeah. But I, I do I do think that if it, the, the, the only solution would have been a rolling lock where as long as somebody in your team in your SO5, like, what, the way I believe it should work, and this might be like, no, maybe not. As, as soon as a region has begun, that should lock all of the cards that are in like teams with that game week. That's what I personally believe, because up until that point, nothing's happened. So changes of teams are open to everybody. But even now, that's like complex. I'm sure that'd be very difficult for so rare to, to introduce. But yeah, I, I think for the all the changes they've implemented, this is one of those ones where you're like, even though it benefits me, why would you have done this? You knew this was going to wind people up. You were better off just keeping the good news only and leaving everything else the same until you had like a proper formulated plan where it didn't impact anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think as well, a little bit with Soria is like part of the reason that we do, part of the reason I enjoy reading those announcements more than once is because sometimes you can hear what they're not saying and you can read between the lines on some things or whatever. And with an announcement like this, sometimes what they don't say is equally as important because this announcement gets followed up with a post saying, oh, a lock and Dan are going to do a Twitter spaces tomorrow. So any questions you've got, come in there and we'll talk about it. It gives them 24 hours to take the temperature in the room. What yeah. is everyone, is everyone annoyed with that? What did they think about this? Is this a problem? Prepared, yeah. We've got all these things up our sleeve, right? What ones will we give them today? Right, okay, well, they want the lock thing for ages. We'll talk about that. And then they wanted to talk about this. So we'll talk about, you know, so yeah. I think there's a wee bit of posture and just like, you know, like, will we get away with this entirely or do we need to satisfy or there's maybe a wee bit of that going on as well. So I know people will be outraged and I always encourage people to be outraged with any kind of feedback or whatever because I'm quite placid before this. I'm quite easy going for the most part, you know, and try and take things from the, a neutral standpoint. And you need people to fight the corner of whatever is being like shat on because, you know, if you don't do it, no one does basically, you know, you, yeah. everyone in this game looks out for their own gallery. 
yeah. that's kind of uh, an important factor of it. So I'm always like, I always like those tweets when I see them and I always engage with them and whatever. And I always encourage people to do so. But I would also, in the same breath, is, uh, you know, don't crucify them until they come to the, until they come fully to the table with everything, you know. Yeah. Do, do, do you know? Because they could move it as well. See what you're saying, Nip? There was two weeks, one in April, one in May. We could get yeah. to the end of the European season and they might just and go. And they, they change it and it doesn't impact anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it absolutely could be. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that, like, obviously, I'm sure we all love Surrey Day, right? Surrey Day is like a yeah. premium platform. One thing I struggle with, and if Laird ever watches this, this would just be amazing, right? When I'm trying to build my game weeks on the lineup builder, you only get to see one line at a time. I need like a tile board where I can like move my cards in and out so that I can see, okay, hold on, this guy I don't like there. Let me move him over there. I, ju I just thought I, ju I need to bring that in because I, I hate preempting lineups. Like I'd love to go in and be like, all right, what am I going to do for three, four, one? What holes have I got? Where can I improve? What can I look to sell because I've got nothing going on? Let me try and build my cap 220s and things like that. It's impossible because you look at one lineup with all the players down the line. Just give me a big, massive tile board where I could just type it in. I mean, you could probably build it yourself. There's probably like a website or something, but yeah, that that would be uh, that'd be amazing. It'd make for like again, that. make for fun content and the ability to be like, oh, what if I put this lineup up and this would be the extras, or if we move these two around here, now what do we have? Like, it would just be nice. Yeah, I'm with you, man, because like when you're doing those lineup builders, if you do want to make a tweak, it's like go back into that team, delete that guy, save the lineup, go yeah. back into the other lineup, oh, yeah. he's not caught, right? Go back into, oh, I didn't delete, oh, I didn't save, and you're scooching about, yeah. and then this combination that you thought, oh, I, bet, I wonder if this would work. You get halfway through making it, and then you're like, what was I even trying to work out here? Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah. I maybe had a winning team in here somewhere, and I can't find it now, you know, because yeah. you've just lost it. So, yeah, well, great suggestion. Yeah. I love that too. There's so many good features on there. I, I love the idea of a bit of drag and drop, like from one lineup into the other and see how that impacts your potential score or something that kind of says like, this is your most powered, like in terms of your collection, this is the the division where you hold the most weight. Uh, like, so maybe go there first and look at that as a potential lineup based on like projections for the week or whatever. I got in touch with, with Laird as well this week because I was trying to, I was trying out chat GPT, trying to figure out ways to use that to, Help me make Line up. In, yeah a little bit more like decisions. So like I was looking at cap mode and wondering if there's like more you know in terms of like the way that we project potential scores. Um, talking about like the home and away kind of bias. So like picking those players who have like a much higher average score when they play at home versus away games. And I thought it'd be really useful on so rare data or on a like spreadsheet or something of identifying players who have like a, a much higher ratio of like home to away or or opposite so that i can kind of see right that player's at home this week they're likely to score f you basically on cat mode you need to score something like what five percent per player yeah. more than they do yeah. so if you can identify five players who are going to score 10 percent more because they're at home um and you select them then you're in with a good shout for cat mode and i was i said to laird is there a way of like scraping the api for like to find out what that ratio of home versus away is like without manually going in you know clicking the home and away on their scores taking a note of what that is then putting that into a spreadsheet all manually for like a hundred odd players or whatever um and he said that that's something that they're looking into so you know like have no doubt so rare data the team there do, seems to do you think though that if it goes too far and so Red Data effectively just picks your best lineup. You know, like you showed earlier with the NBA thing, right? Where you're just like, boom, there's your lineup. How boring would that be if I just go on so Red Data, click auto, 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 down all the regions I'm yeah. managing for, submit right. those in, click it and disappear. It, I, I'll get zero satisfaction out of that, even if it wins, because I'll be like, oh, I didn't do anything here. I might, I'm the exactly. bystander to the to the product, and that's not what I play so Red for. Part Although of I love doing the digging, isn't it? That's it is, yeah. And although I love like definitely efficiency of like just understanding data quickly, and that's where I think Surrey Data is very good because you can click the home and away buttons on Surrey Data and just take a snapshot yourself and be like, okay, he, he looks like he, he scores better or worse in situations like this. But yeah, if, I think if it did it all for you, yeah, I, I would definitely uh, have a lot less fun, I think. Yeah, it's more of like an indicator, isn't it? It's like give me a rough idea of what I've got and what they're up against, but you still know you know, like that machine knowledge versus like actual ball knowledge or like watching the game. 
oh no, like I might I might feel like I have a better knowledge of like what that starting lineup might be or the likelihood that that player is actually going to keep a clean sheet that they think it's going to keep. And yeah. there's still a lot of that involved in it. So I think, and another thing as well is like, as a player of so rare, you know full well that 90% of the people who are winning cards on so rare are in data, are on so rare data doing exactly what you've done. Yeah. And if you don't tweak it a little bit, you are just going to find yourself behind everyone. So it's like, the trick with so rare data, I think, is using it as an indicator, but then digging a bit deeper, watching players, obviously, but then obviously like other sites like FB Ref and looking at like their scores per ninety minutes played. Or so if there's a player coming in, it's like, well, if they play a full ninety, what are they likely to score versus like the sort of fifteen minutes they tend to get last season or something like that? And I think that's the thing is that's really exciting about the transfer market and this time of the season where players are moving, and you think is that a good move for that player? Is this a good move for that player? And trying to react before everyone else on the platform does, because you know every time there's a move, the market reacts, prices go up or down based on how we all think that move is going to be. But I, I love getting into the depth of what are the stats? Is that a good move? What does that? What's that manager's history with young players? What All those kind of things are like, you can't, that doesn't come from data. You have yeah. to know a little bit about the philosophy of a team versus you know or like is that player's attitude has he left that team because he's fallen out with the manager is he likely to fall out there's things like that that you know you don't have data on that you have to know so i think there'll always be an element of having a bit of knowledge to yeah. this that um but yeah i think so rare data as a tool is like really useful i've, in that I've got an interesting question for, for you both and for the viewers when they come to the comments of this and stuff I, I believe that you can start with nothing, especially now more so than ever, that you can start with nothing and within 12 to 18 months have a one plus ETH gallery without spending anything, especially now with what they've got. And I get asked a lot, do you make money from so rare? How do you make money from so rare? How much can I withdraw? How can I withdraw? And I'm like, steady on, like you've got to get the basics in right mm. first, right? Do you think that's possible? And I, what I believe is, and do you agree like, it all comes down to effectively time and knowledge. If you put the time in, even as a free-to-play player, the amount of Bundesliga lineups I've seen this week that don't have verts in their team, yeah. I'm like, you haven't got a clue what you're doing. You're just going to lose. Now, he might drop a stinker, but just <laughs> to have him for those 35 tokens and then have a secondary midfielder like Kimmich, the 60-odd yeah. tokens, that's a quarter of your budget for a quarter of your team, but you've got two well-beaters in there. So it's like having that time and knowledge... From free to play, this is what I'm going to pose to do on my free to play account. Is that I I hope that by the end of 2023, my gallery is worth more than a thousand pounds as a free to play user, without really trading, like buying players when I think they're cheap, selling them when they're expensive, sure, but not actually going out putting in eight percent offers on loads of things to sell them at ninety percent and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's possible, or or am I dreaming? I definitely think with what's been laid out in front of us, it's. <clears throat> definitely much more conceivable i would have agreed with you beforehand like if you'd you know uh, getting out of common and unlimited is probably the hardest part of that journey if you yeah. know what i mean but once you've got a couple of limiteds locked in and you're starting to roll with the punches because like i'll never forget like early in the platform like you you kind of mentioned it earlier Nep, I, f I forget if we were actually recording at the time or not but like when you've got like when you've got OP players going around, like Cecinias and, and whoever, right? And it's the, at the time, so there's only got the K and the J and MLS and a couple of pieces over here and over there. They are exclusively the Apex Predators. And then the more choice it comes out, there's more people to choose from. By virtue of that happening, the leaderboards become deaf, dumb and blind to maybe 40% of the market, I would suggest, give or take. So... Because there's blind spots, particularly in those limited competitions as well, once you've got the first couple of limiteds, and this is the kind of point I was, I was hoping to make, when you intimately know them, because you've only got three or four of them, you've only yeah. got ten, you know they're at home to this team, and this guy's now going to be on pens because that guy's suspended or whatever, then um, you you have an edge on the leaderboard. Because again, kind of like what Stish is saying, you know, numbers, football is probably the hardest to predict sport probably in the world and so many metrics, you know, who's going to win, who many goals, clean sheets, you know, it's impossible. So um, I definitely believe it would have been possible with a bit of proper grind, I think. I think it's been made a bit easier now, but I, I would 100%, yeah, I would go along with that for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it'd be really interesting to see how these new sort of like progression 
things work out for players who maybe pick up their first limited from, you know, like a free to play? How easy is it going to be to win that first limited? I think that's the that'll be the hardest thing is like winning that first limited, and then how how you progress from there into the next division without buying any any cards. I think um, I definitely think it's possible to turn maybe like a fifty to sixty quid into a, a, a grand. But I think that if until I see how potentially easy it might be to win a limited and how good that limited might be to take into like the two seventy cap or that kind of thing. I think that will be interesting to see. And so like following your uh, road to glory will actually be really interesting in that sense. And I think I've got friends of mine who kind of like joined the platform, but maybe like lost interest in it a little bit. And it'd be really interesting to kind of like reconnect with some of them and be like, you should try the free to play or like yeah. use that, use a couple of your limiteds in this instead. Cause like maybe some of them have not bought a goalkeeper still because when they got involved, even the limited goalkeepers were still a like hundred quid or yeah, yeah, yeah. And now they're not. Man. You know, you, you can pick a limited goalkeeper up who starts for like thirty or forty quid if you know where yeah. to. Yeah. And if you really do your digging, you can pick one up for fifteen, twenty quid. Like, yeah. If you know who's made a move recently, except etc. And that, that you said, that's the game. That is the part of the game, as well as like winning divisions is part of the game. It's not all about having a win in the division it might be that you picked up a card that is 15 dollars, and next week it's 20 and you sell it and then you reinvest that 20 into two players who are a tenner and then they go to 15 20 quid and you reinvest it's that's that's another way to win on the platform and i was i did a i did like an asia build in limited like a squad of 11 players that was 75 dollars the other week and the last time i checked that is now at like 95 so that's already 25 in profit before it's even had been used in a lineup and yeah there's so many ways to turn a profit in the game um and i think sometimes there is too much focus solely on winning cards and it's like winning cards should be seen as like a bonus because you can scrape the ETH, you can win a card you can but the the the, the zero to a thousand thing is really interesting i think it'll be really interesting to see how these like new cap modes at the end of the month when they open, it'll be a lot clearer in my head. I think it is possible, but how, how possible I think will be a little bit more visible once, you know, those reward pools come out and stuff like that, that, you know, or, or how easy it might be to win. I think from the, if we look at the global cup, you could go from zero, win a few of the sort of collectible pieces, sell them for 50 P to two quid, depending on, yeah, how early you get rid of them, um, and it's like, yeah, like I probably won eight to ten quids worth of like collectible cards on the global cup, and I played. I was awful at it. I had a really, I had an absolute stinker on the global cup. Um, I, you know, I went a bit, bit too Argentina heavy at the beginning, failed in the first game week, and then as it went on, everyone else sort of like had the same team as me, and it was like, yeah, and he was really too late yeah. behind. Yeah, what, what one of the funny things about the global cup was. On my free to play account, I started it for the Global Cup because it was like, hey guys, now's a perfect time to get involved as a free to play yeah. user. What I did, and one of the things I did on that was I didn't build a team for the Global Cup. I built a team for Commons for after yeah, the yeah. Global Cup. So now that they're changing those Commons, I've done myself dirty in the Global Cup because I wanted to use them somewhere else down the line. And now they're cutting the, you know, cutting me off at the wrist there. And it's like, I, I did end up winning one reward from the Global Cup on the free-to-play. It was worth like 15 quid, which is how I ended up getting a bit of ETH on the account. Um, but I sat there and I thought, man, I did very well with a team that wasn't built for the Global Cup. Imagine if I actually built it for the Global Cup. And it's, yeah. if there's a satisfaction as a content creator, as a football fan, as a competitor with you guys, with everyone that's watching, with everyone that's on so rare. there's a satisfaction of just being better than someone at a game, even if it's free-to-play. There is a grand satisfaction of being like, yeah, five hundred thousand people ended here, and I, I finished in like top two thousand. Like, like go me, do you know what I mean? And like, some people are just mad unlucky. Some people gave up. Some people, you, you like, got really fortunate and picked guys that scored points that you just could never have like projected and just got lucky. But generally speaking, one of the reasons why I, I love the idea of the road to glory again is because I get to, I, at least I think I do, and it might just be a massive ego that's just going to get brought down to reality. I think I'm very good at SO5. I think I can pick the best players that are going to score the best. And I think that's going to translate in the content and show people don't need a massive bank balance. 
you don't need to be scared of crypto. You yeah. can enjoy the journey, the understanding of football, finding players and teams you've never found before, and have that chance over a long period of time of changing your life with it as well. And I, I like that kind of like like romance just really brings me in. Yeah, no, I totally get that. I'd agree with that. I think um, one one thing I was going to say. Sorry, just to, just to cut you in there, but like there's. On this kind of vein of what we're talking about, there's a comment came in here saying that he, uh, Baird 07, he's been playing for two weeks and he feels it's very difficult to win a limited. Just to kind of tie that into what we are saying here, at the moment with limiteds, right, if you do, if, part of the reason I think Nepenthes can achieve this over 12 to 18 months is because I think to achieve that, you need to build a team that is going to be able to be, you, you're going to need to build a team that can be entered to potentially win cards in cap 270. Because when you read that article, the philosophy of the, the, the rewards, I've put my notes away, but the philosophy of the rewards for the new system is best cards up at the higher cap modes that feed you double bubble. So you win limited and you win rares, you know. So if you can compete in that, you only need one or two victories to go in your favor, and you know, that goal is achieved. On top of that, at the moment, we've got All Star, America, Challenger, Champion Europe, Second Division, Specialist, Under 23, and Underdog. Was that like eight divisions or something? Yeah. After this change, we're going to have that same core, right? Expect no underdog and no specialist. So losing two divisions, but we're going to gain three capped modes and you're going to gain five divisions where you're going to gain La Liga Limited, Bundesliga Limited, Serie A Limited, etc. So if you're finding it difficult to compete in specialist now, that will change very quickly. And very here soon. was one thing that I'm interested to get answers on is I actually think there's four capped modes, right? At 220, yeah, there, there's... 222, 270, and kickoff. Not really a cap mode, but it's, okay, it's there. Kickoff for, um, yeah, add that into. Yeah, because yeah. if you're a new player, you probably don't have too many. But also, there is, um, so if like, so you get the amateur, the pro, and the the one in, whatever the one is in between. I'm interested to know if you can play all of these at once, because what yeah. did transpire is that when you draft your eight commons you can play them multiple times in multiple divisions which is how you'll have enough commons to play um the limited um the limited the cap 220 basically that'll be your common you'll have to take it from there so you can play but let's say you draft on a you can play don as your limited 220 common goalkeeper and play him in the french league like draft mode right um mm. Which is so I'm interested to know if you can play all three, but then is it also going to be all three of those modes for all five of the leagues? Because if it is, that's now 15. Added. Yeah, I don't think they'll go to leagues. I think it's saying the cap modes are like all stars yeah. almost, you know, uh, not not the cap mode. Let me get the um, or the semi pro and the yeah, the semi pro stuff because that's league specific. Now, is that league specific as in the sense of you have to submit Ooh. one league, or is that league specific as in there will be one league for each one? The way I read that is you'll on board as being La Liga. So you're going to be in the La Liga thread through that. Oh, uh, okay. That's the way I read that. So you come out the other side of that and then you're doing all the other stuff, that the yeah. caps and whatever. So, so you think that's going to be locked to people that play into the caps mode? I think that'll be homogenous. Yeah, I think that'll yeah. be like all La Liga cards, who you're competing with, who you're selecting, what you're rewarded. E you know even I mean? so, as a free-to-play user, and this is how I think it'll be a great way to get into like Cap 220 modes as a free-to-play user is you will effectively be able to rinse and repeat that. You you know, you won't progress yeah. like an academy. You won't progress to the next until you finish the first, which is winning a limited. So once you get to the end out of the pro where you have to have four or five limiteds in there, you've now got a team or you've got an ability to sell, get some players that you know will do well in 220. And that's where I think the progression really comes on. And especially the cap 240 for limited, you know, like you said, Stitch, like it's 5% on top is all you need. So finding those players that regularly score a hundred or two hundred percent more, like those, you know, those guys that get thirty-five points when they don't score a goal, or eighty points when they end up getting a decisive. They're going to help you pick up those five bucks, maybe only once or twice a month, but all of a sudden you got ten bucks in your account. Now you can go mm. and buy three or four players to help in another area, or to buy that you think are going to double in price and go again. And that, like, although it's, I hate the wait. You know, like I'm, I'm so eager for tomorrow's tomorrow at 11 o'clock you know i just can't wait for it even though the first game doesn't kick off till three o'clock tomorrow at 11 o'clock i'm just so eager for it i hate the waiting i do i like i i'm genuinely like so excited for the next six nine twelve months of like yeah th this this could be a good way 
like I, I genuinely think you can farm it. But then, I, then comes the realization of if you can farm it and everyone can farm it, it's gonna be shit in it because everything <laughs> it will just be worthless. Like anything that offers too much to people that don't put money into the platform, if all people are doing is taking money out of the platform, it's gonna be a bad look and it's it's just not gonna work long term. I, I think anyone who really likes football, it's hard to just like sell up and leave, though, isn't it? Like I, I think like people might come in with the intention of farming. But then once they get into it, they're like, oh, yeah. it's nothing. Because that was me. I think like my initial my initial like involvement with Sora is like I, I'm a massive football fan, but I also had like an interest in the crypto side of things. And I saw my friend trying to get me on this for ages. He went, he was in like football index and all that before. I never really got involved in any of that. Then this came about. I had some Ethereum and I did see it as a farming exercise i was like oh this will be much more fun than just putting it in like a yield farming thing and like getting a little bit of eth each week i was like oh, i can get eth every week doing this but i'm playing football and i wasn't really thinking about it from like how much fun i might have doing it but now i it's more about like i think the gameplay had its own like level of value which is far greater than i expected and i would i think anyone who really likes football who does find their way into this, I'm pretty confident that like a high percentage of them convert themselves to like that. Their, their, their conversion rate from like non-paying to paying must be quite good for, for a yeah. free play game. Which is to, why like, I also think that they're very open to like giving out lots of limited to free yeah. to pay because once you get that one limited, yeah, you're like, ah, oh, do I just go and buy the next limited? Uh, yeah. but, but I say to people a lot, like, you know, I, I would never suggest to someone to spend money they don't have or put in money they can't afford or you know not pay their rent or anything but like i asked i got asked a question before of like about just like gambling or draft kings and things like that and unless i go to the casino with family or friends for like a night out gambling i have not looked at a gambling website since i started on so rare because this scratches that itch of that and you hold the asset and i'd say to anyone if if you go out on a, if, if you really, really love football and you'd like, you've played the free to play side of So Rare, which I would urge everyone to do because there's so much available right now that even if you've got like some capital to put in, don't just play the free to play for a month or two, see how the game works. But I, I say to people like, like if you really want to get involved, just don't go out next Friday night, yeah. save that 100 quid, put it into So Rare and see, like, now you've got. Well, last you a whole uh, season, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now you can play for a long, long, long time on so rare, or you know, like don't go, don't you know, get off Triple Eight yeah. online for for a few weeks and invest that money into so rare instead. Because the, like the way I see it is like, obviously, I would love to make a living through so rare. I would love to be good enough at the game to win rewards, cash them out, withdraw money, and still be good enough to play. But what I've put in, I don't look at as money that goes up or down i literally look at it as oh, i've spent that money it's gone as if i was at a casino or as if i went out or as if i bought a bit of technology like it's just gone so i like i like like with you like stitch it's like the love that i get from so rare makes when i actually purchase something or invest in it not a bill or a yeah. fee or a loss it's just me enjoying what like you know my my my, my spare time with, you know, my, my passion or whatever. It's just enjoying yeah. it like you would with buying a football shirt or a football ticket. That's how I equate it. That's totally. a good point. And I mean, you coming back from like a FIFA background as well, like the amount of money that people spend on that and they have on no points. points. Yeah. And it's then they just it gets all deleted at the end of the That's season. It. And you're like, yep, nice. Yeah. The season, except that you've lost like thousands just spending on points. But you play the game and there's no qualms when the new one comes out next year and you start it all over again. But... Yeah, that's the same here, except you don't have to start all over again next season. Your cards last as long as the player lasts in their career, basically. And you just keep building, yeah. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. And that, I think like a really interesting point, actually, like on the subject of FIFA, I'd love to pick your brain on it, is there's a, a, always a big backlash, particularly from the gaming industry, on anything that has to do with blockchain. Um, you're someone who obviously crosses both, both sort of like areas in that like you've got a following of people that like fifa but also play so rare how many of how much of like that backlash do you see 
from the FIFA community who are like, oh, it's NFTs, like, don't touch it. It's a scam. It's You must that's see a lot is. of that, right? How, yeah. how that's, can that's, that's Reg- all of it, all it is. Yeah. Other, other than the people that are, like, fully involved that watch a SoRare stream or watch the, you know, bond onto the SoRare channel or something, whenever I talk about NFTs, just met with immediate, no, yeah. that's a scam. And I'm like, you're happy to pay 80 quid to FIFA for 12,000 FIFA points that they own. It says it in the small print. Yeah. Everything is licensed to them. So even when you buy a pack and pack and Mbappe, it's theirs. You don't have it. I'm like, you're happy for that. You're literally getting mugged off in front of your very face and you're giving it a thumbs up. <laughs> then I'm like, you could buy something where you own the digital asset and they're like, no, that's a scam. Yeah, it's mad. And it's like, yeah, you, you, but like, I think, you know, the, the global adoption of NFTs, Web3, cryptocurrency is probably going to take another decade or two. Yeah. But I think over time specifically with so rare and if, if they can kind of mimic some sort of fpl with this draft system and stuff then i do think that it could very quickly change a lot of gamers or yeah. online enthusiasts gambling people that like to gamble people in DraftKings or daily fantasy fantasy sports players to come on to so rare because it is a premium product and i said this to people on stream all the time you play so rare like religiously sorry fpl religiously Give it one week on so rare, you won't even look at FPL again. Yeah. You, I, you just won't care. It's po- it's meaningless. It's pointless. I find it so difficult. It's like, a Pepsi challenge it. to do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is it. On on the subject of FPL, actually, as well, uh, one of the big key takeaways for me of all of this, and I believe this is what I believe, right? Here's my like little conspiracy theory. Obviously, we all think the Prem's come in at some point. My thoughts are this, that this change of the game week lock for your lineups is to accommodate all of the new users that are going to be coming when they launch the premier league product because obviously they launch a premier league free to play they're trying to onboard all of the fpl players and trying to bring them over the fpl players are going to moan that you can't select your teams if you've got not got the team news this 3 p.m lock will allow most of the team news to be in the public domain before you lock in your lineup for that weekend. So my thinking is this, they see the potential onboarding of FPL users and like Premier League fans as bigger than the user base we've currently got now who are getting upset about the lock, the new time of the lock. And they're preempting the potential moans that they're going to have from all these new users that are like, why can't I, how can I set a lineup without knowing the news? So a, I think this for me cements it. Like I've always been up and down. Like, oh, is the prem coming? I'm, I'm certain it's coming now because I think that's yeah. exactly why they've done this. Uh, what do you two think about that? Oh, it really. feels like the writing's on the wall, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, like, and again, like <clears throat> what you're saying there, like the 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 detail that the Penfez has brought to this conversation over the Asian stuff. So rare would have had access to that info as well when making this decision and. I know it's easy for all of us to, or a lot of people that are affected to go, oh, it's 11 game weeks and it's this and it's that. But like, if you know, if you're looking at it from a bird's eye view, if the actual implied difference is negligible to zero, mm. then I don't know if they really have prioritized one group over another. It's well, like on, on we can note. change something to make something better and you guys are actually no worse off than you were last season. Yeah, and on that you know, note, Josh like that. in the comments, he said there were eight teams who had double game weeks and two fixtures split at the weekend in the first five game weeks in the K-League last year. With the old cut off, yeah. and now there's none yeah, in the first five yeah. game leagues this week this year. So this actually, it's it, it might just be different games that are missing the cut offs and being put in midweek instead of weekend. But it's not more. In fact, it seems like it's less. Nep, I know you hold Romulo in the uh, Chinese Super League as well. Hey, yeah. How many yeah. double game weeks has he had? Because I've, I I've, went through three, three on his on his like one one year on his last one know. year. So, um, and, and one of them, he got 56 points in the first one and 100 points in the second game. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah, I missed out on that 100 points. Like, although I didn't own him then, but still, yeah. On that, having the best ball in that double game week, that would maybe wash the face of this that, a little bit better, wouldn't it? That needs See, so I, I, I somewhat agree with PSU fans on, like, like, best ball is not the option, though, is it? Because all you're going to do is you're going to put in an all-sand stack and then you're going to have, on the on the weeks that they've got double game weeks, people that can afford to are just going to go and buy the best stacks in limited rare and super rare put them in, get two shots at a, at a big score, and they're just mm-hmm. going to dominate. And, and it will be unfair to people that only have the one shot in the teams that they, they put in. I, I don't know what the answer is, because obviously in NBA, you, you kind of like, 
everyone's got the same. They've all got double game, triple yeah, game. Yeah, or, mm. and sometimes people have one game week and you're literally like, yeah, I'm not putting him in. It's not that. Like, I'm going to go for a guy that's got two games or three games. Um, because it happens so more commonly. It's like, if, if in football it was more double game weeks than less, okay, maybe you can make an argument for it. But on those occasions where somebody gets a double game week and everybody else doesn't, I don't like the best ball. I, I like the idea of selecting which game you want the score from before it locks rather than the first game only because you might be like look i don't want to play him in this game i want the points from this game so if you decide that yourself as a conscious decision which score you want prior to the scores being had that's a lot better um so on that yeah i like that because that's effectively picking. what you're doing when you put a player into a lineup anyway is you're making a conscious decision that you want that person's points from that game i like that and that adds a new uh, differential as well because if people have got that same player, yeah. they pick the different score. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It could make a big difference in the yeah the end of the week. Yeah, interesting that. I seen just in the comments actually, someone whose whose uh, name did pop up in this discussion quite a bit was a uh, K Sare Sare, or K oh, Sare. Sare. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, they were the one actually that that pointed out to me that as much as they're not using losing utility, that's where the, like the split of the game weeks comes in difficult for people who maybe have one goalkeeper and are going to lose, you know, the likelihood that they can field a full team in any given like midweek or weekend game week where like the Korean fixtures or the J league fixtures are split into two. Um, and they're in the chat now. And they've just pointed out that the, uh, the point we were making about the K league um, only like having the same sort of amount of fixtures. They said that that, that was in a world cup year. Um, and the deadline will definitely negatively impact Kaylee compared to previous years. Oh, okay. Well, that's but, an interesting detail to add. And I suppose but, I'm not the, the, the before, World Cup this year was well, wonky, wasn't it? Yeah, but also the year before there was a Euro League during the summer. Sorry, the um, the not Euros. the World Cup, the yeah, the Euros, also during the summer, which would have impacted game weeks and locks and players not being in and being in. Like, there, there's always yeah, you know. Then the year before that, there was COVID and like. There's going to be yeah. something, you know what I mean? Like it, the, the, something impacted everybody every time, right? Like, you know, you have a like last night, uh, the Dundee game got called off <laughs> yeah. because of a frozen pitch. So I've, I've missed out on chance of winning a reward now because of that, because of, you know, existential circumstances. You, you, I don't think you can, I don't, I don't think picking a league and saying, let's just make sure we facilitate for that league is as like, I think it's just as bad as saying, let's not facilitate for that league at all. I, I think making sure, as I say, like one of the comments there was uh, from, from Josh that last time around, let's find how many it was again. Uh, there was two fixtures split at the weekend in the first five game weeks in the K-League last season. Okay, it was a World Cup game week. It, and, and I'd be interested to get K. Soares uh opinion here. You have until April, until the first weekend to midweek split, and until May for the first double game week. How much time do you need to reorganize your gallery? How much time is a fair amount of time for a change implemented to make a difference? I think that's more than a reasonable amount of time. I think to... the main impact is the goalkeepers, isn't it? The goalkeeper situation, because it, it suggests now that, like, obviously getting the outfield players, you can kind of pick uh, some pieces that you can move around. But I think a lot of people probably only have one rare goalkeeper. And I think like, especially in the, uh, a lot of the people that have like voiced their, their, um, their differences with this are people who play um, Asia, particularly Korea, because we can see the fixtures um, okay. that are going to be affected. Um, so I guess it is one of those things, isn't it? It's like the rare goalkeeper situation. Because I think like the limited one's not so bad, you know, like if you have to reinvest any money, there are options out there for like maybe $30, $40, but with a rare goalkeeper, you're looking at another three, four hundred quid. And it's, yeah, I can kind of, I, I can see, I haven't like gone deep enough into my own gallery to see like where I will be affected, but I'm sure I'm going to be at the brunt of a few of those splits. Um, and I guess it's like, it's going to impact people who play outside of their regions as well. Less so. There's definitely a lot of players um, that like to play like the Korean League or the J League only and maybe enter those lineups into those um um what's the word um the region the regional tournaments another thing it probably will impact as well is 
you know how we see at the moment with the America um, leagues being open, but we've only got Liga MX, but we've only got a few covered teams or minted teams from that. So like, it's actually really difficult to field a team or win. And it means that the prize pools are all a lot lower as well. We obviously know at the moment we don't have um, licensed J League for next season. It's still like in talks. So not only does this create a little bit of a difficult situation for people who are holding Korean cards, the prize pools as it stands without that license from the J League means that the Asia prize pools are also going to be depleted a little bit unless that license comes in. Nicholas has said on Twitter that he does expect it to come in but if it doesn't it starts to make that that asia region look a little bit difficult and i can understand what's avoiding there there yeah, yeah it would be pointless and unless aren't they getting the a league well we ha- wouldn't that get put into the asia league fingers crossed i think if it does come it goes into asia right it's yeah it's yeah part of that continent it's in the acl it's uh so yeah hopefully i mean that's and, just and then the if they do it. start you know scoring or licensing you know Al Nassar or the Saudi League or you know think, yeah. China. It's yeah, gonna apply yeah, Chinese League, yeah, all of a sudden, yeah. you know, it, it could it could be the place to be, you know, like it's mm. it's a lot of if buts you know, a lot of speculation on that regard. Um and, and even with prize pools in general, you haven't got a clue what they're gonna do with these prize pools come game week three, four, one. They they could be incredible, they could be awful, you know, more tournaments could be less prizes across the board everywhere else. Like it's it's just Oh wait, have you got news? Could he have you? Yeah. No, no. I'm just. Oh, I, no. I, I think they're going to be good. I think they're going to be good. I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. Fingers crossed. But it'd be interesting to see. I'm definitely. I feel like a lot of us are waiting to see what cards are in those pools, as well as obviously having the e thresholds. Great, but really intrigued to see like what kind of card wins we can get if we get like into the upper echelons. Um, and it'd be really interesting to see: Are we targeting this, or are we just? Is this just a side game to try and win a bit of extra cash? Um, I had a look at the the uh, the kickoff. There's a unique kickoff, and I've got I've got a unique available this weekend. And I was trying to figure out: Do you go for the unique kickoff where you can win a unique? There's only three prizes though, so I think it's still. I think obviously it, it deters Wales because you can't play it if you've got more than ten uniques. If I'm understanding it correctly, That's great, so yeah. like it's exactly for people like me who I own currently three uniques. I want to add another one so that I could open up that. D1 potentially but as it stands i do own three uniques there's three uniques at stake you can win three uniques they are tier three uniques though or do i go into d2 u23 or challenger where where i can play you still use one of my uniques in there um and possibly win like a tier two or get lucky and win a tier one super rare i, I um, think it comes down to the strength of your l15 under 55 yeah. super rares if you've got really favourable well, 15 under 55s, I would definitely play that. I mean, when you look at the ratio, it's 21 people have entered three rewards. That straight away gives you the best percentage of prizes across the whole platform, right? That's like 15% chance, you know, top 15% win a reward. I don't think that happens anywhere else. Obviously, it's a bit of an exclusive thing. How, however, of those 21 teams that have been submitted, how many of them that are just people that have got some stuff left that have just thrown it in there? So if yeah, you're putting an actual dedicated lineup in there, I think you've got a great chance of winning a unique. And, you know, something that I plan to do at the lower level on a road to glory is farm kickoffs. I, I wanted to do it now before these new changes, right? I, I think it was it's easy to change to 500. Yeah, <laughs> I think, like I, I genuinely think, especially at the lower level where there's a lot more liquidity in cards and a lot more freedom of just picking up a guy that you think is going to fall out is like, is there to farm it. But you've got... You know six or seven really quality like mid-range uniques i know, I know it's a lot easier said than done they're, they're, you know they're very exclusive um every time you win one sell it off you reinvest into some more quality elsewhere yeah well, and it like it allows that snowball the kickoff again. unique is actually super rares plus one unique so it's just pretty much the same as what you could do in d2 so it's like i've got one unique available this weekend my main problem i think is What's putting me off at the minute from it is my forward option um, because it has to be uh, under 55 average, which a lot of my super rares are like that anyway, to be honest. Um, (laughs) Got a couple that that kind of like buck the trend, but most of them are like in that sort of area from where I've won tier two and threes down the line. Um, My my forward options this weekend in terms of forwards 
uh, super is a really is really poor. So I'm like, I think like an, a, a below par performance in a high in a decent performing super rare team with a unique in it to bol bolster that score up. And my unique should score well if he plays. I'm thinking I'm more likely to win a tier two super, like realistically, than win a tier three unique, which could be more useful than the tier three unique as well. Because I think depending on what region I win that unique in, I might just be sat waiting to get enough uniques to enter a D1. But um, if we're talking a U23 D3, that's different. If I win a U23 D3 unique, it has the potential to become something. Whereas yeah. if you win like a 35-year-old um, tier three unique, you might not even get that much utility out of it. So it's it's a difficult one because I love the idea of winning a unique, but at the moment it's like in terms of potential yeah. yield and likelihood to card, I think I could finish somewhere in the cards in U23 or Challenger super rare, but maybe not so much in the... I don't know. be interesting to see what those scores... Come in. I might sit out of it this week, see what the winning scores are, and, and look then at cry it. that you didn't put the team in and missed out. Yeah, on the yeah. So, I will. Yeah, I'll be kicking myself if I'm like, oh, I could have won that division. <laughs> I know you'll be chasing down some uh, some end product this weekend. The pen fairs where your kind of hopes coming into the weekend. What team you? What league you? Oh, mate, I've, I've been, in. Yeah, I've been reorganising my gallery a little bit, and I've got some uh, some really really strong lineups for this game week. So my all-star rare, probably my most favourable. I bought Guerrerian from Tigres and Gignac from Tigres. So I've got them as a little half stack with Sanger, who I won as a reward. And PSV have yes. got mad favourable matchup against Vitesse. Yes. Got Ronaldo and Jose Caro, who's just the best goalkeeper on the platform. Um, so <laughs> um, um, among a few other uh, few other really strong lineups, that's the one. Like I, I genuinely think I've got a chance of winning all-star rare this week. I like it. Yeah. I like it. You should definitely be consider that a challenge. I'll race you to the top on that one. Yeah, I'm thinking the, the same. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, every time I watch you, though, Quiddy, you always go in to teams with the mindset of this can win. Yeah. I have a, I, I, like, I build too many teams, and it's one of the things I've tried to actively change over the last few months is I build teams that I hope can just hit a reward if this guy plays or if that guy gets a start or if this guy hits a decisive. And I'm trying to reorganize into teams where even on a bad week, they're getting a reward. But yeah. I want to win with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, it's more like, uh, like uh, it's just a. I'm a bit of an optimist in that sense. So I'm all like, if, especially yeah. if you listen to me rather than watch what's on the screen, I'm always telling myself the best case scenario. Like, yeah. Kyogo's going to get a couple of goals. We're going to get a clean sheet here. That's 400 points for this team. Yeah, you know, the next one. You know, but yeah. um, but no, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. It's, it's setting that kind of bar. Eh? You know, like shoot for the stars and land on Mars yeah. and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Know? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm looking at my main entry last week was quite good for me. And I noticed that not on purpose, but where I'd normally go into like the pro divisions, I just, I I've, I've looked more at putting a strong team in rare and then using some of my better supers in the D2. Cause you don't need them. like, you don't need the high, high scores in D2, especially on a mid on a weekend games when all of the leagues are open and stuff. So my, my current aims, if you like, I've got um, a pretty good, a champ euro team out again um i've got verts and musiala in there verts is back i was going to use him in like specialist but the problem is i think I, I, I couldn't do it i was like the other options i had under 40 there's only one other good option under 40 but um it's kenneth taylor he's l4 l15 of 40 they're playing against feyenoord away top of the league i yeah. haven't had a win in the last five um, they're struggling a little bit, not struggling, but by Ajax uh, standards, yeah, they are. Yeah. they're in bad form. Um, so I went away from specialist, and I've put I've put a, a decent lineup together in Super A U23. I've got uh, Gaetan Cook, uh, Super Ayumu Seku, um, uh, unique. He's my this is my first time I'm using him. Um, he's got a really tough match against young boys, though. Grasshoppers, he plays for. Um, got Joey Veerman, super rare. He came in off the bench in the last PSV game, so I'm hoping he starts this weekend. Um, Kenneth Taylor. And then the weak link there is Ole Romani of Emmen, who hasn't had a he's, goal as well. But he's a quality young player. He is. He's I've great. Been, like, tracking him a bit. He's He's very good, yeah. So I'm hoping that team can yield something for me. I'm I'm not again like talking about like trying to win or trying to like I, for me. I'm always looking at trying to win like a tier two, whether that's a super or a rare. 
if I can win a tier two, whatever league I'm playing in, I'm quite happy like to tr try and win some. But going back to that point I made right at the beginning of the pod about why have I got a gallery that big that shouldn't be competing for? And yeah, maybe this is the sort of potential payoff. But um, yeah, do I need to downsize and go big by the, like, the big cards that everyone needs? But I guess I always buy hoping that they'll become those cards. So um, yeah. Yeah, I think like if I'm just staying, if I stay patient, I'm sure it'll all pay off in the end. But yeah, looking forward to the game week. I've got 15 teams I think lined up, which is wow. uh, which is quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I've gone big in rare champ Euro this week again after having a win or yeah, I managed to win a Gerard Moreno rare, which at first I was a little bit yeah disappointed with. But the more I looked at it, I'm like, Do you know what? That's a really good card. Um, it's a valuable card if I wanted to get rid of it. If I was that bothered about losing it, but where I've, I'm a bit thin on forwards, but I've got some good forward options in Champ Euro. I've decided to stick them both in the same team. So I've gone Kevin Trapp, Giovanni Di Lorenzo, Tony Cruz, Jocelyn, and Gerard Moreno. I think that is like a banging lineup for a rare. He was literally just chatting about Jocelyn. And, uh, yeah. And doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah I'm, fingers crossed. If that's why it's in my head. So. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm feeling some end products coming, hopefully, over the weekend. What about you, Quinny? What, what what have you got going on this weekend? I'm going to be chasing down the Penfez and All Star Rare um, with my maxed out cards that I've got, and then I'm going to be <laughs> taking my super rares and throwing them into specialist and trying win a unique. So I'm kind of doing everything we're talking about. <laughs> who, who who are you putting in that's got the high XP? Um, my, so my provisional uh, team that now includes All Black at level twenty, good game at home, works at level nineteen. And uh, I've seen your face there. <laughs> and then I've got, uh, actually, there are three guys in the middle. Their XP isn't that great. But I've got another option or two that I'm not going to use that are on like level 10s and uh, 20s and stuff like that. Bad fixtures. Andy Robertson and uh, Castellanos and Gio Reyna and whatever. Yeah. My, my under 23 is best for, um, best for like the XP because I've got Murich. He's already lost his season bonus. I've still got him on eight and a half percent. I've got Jonathan Davids on ten percent after season bonus has finished. Sorry. Enzo Fernandez is on like eight percent, and uh, this uh, this guy that I won last season they haven't minted new cards yet, so he's on like eight percent as well. So I've, I've got like decent XP in under twenty three rare, but Maybe. I just I have those non elite under twenty three rares, so I need all of them to have a good week together, and it rarely happens. Yeah, yeah I know that feeling I for sure, man. I've got a really good U23 uh, rare lineup, but my forwards letting me down and they've got an awkward fixture. I've got Murich, Obispo, Verts, Musiala, and Piro in my See, rare. That's why, like, like from an outsider's point of view for your gallery, right? I just sit there and think, I just, why don't you have Carlson? Why don't I had you him. have him? I sold him. I had Carlson. Why would you <laughs> sell Carlson? He's like <laughs> premium under 23 forward scorer. I, I wish I had him now. I mean, I, I do have some. A lot of my good ones aged out. I think that's why I sold him. When I did sell him, I had really good options and he wasn't as good as like Chiesa and a few other. But like, I just wish one of my Verts or Musiala was a forward card. They're both good yeah. cards. If I had one of those as a forward, I'm really tempted almost, but they're both maxed out 10%. I'm like letting go of one of those. And they're both like rookie cards, if you like. Yeah. They're, they're two of the oldest cards in my gallery, which makes them even harder to let go. The Verts card is the lucky number 21. It's like my favourite number. I'm just like, I can't swap one of them. I almost need to spend out, but I can't spend that money on a forward card. I'm Carl, Carlson's actually, I, there, I saw a few rumours that he's like linked to Manchester United. Mm. I, I know he ages out at the end of the season. Um, but yeah, he, he's a little over one ETH at the moment. I think mm. that is an insane was, price. I'm, I'm actually tempted to just invest a little bit more into to buy him because I, I just think that's way too good of a price. I've been really tempted. Unless he to goes to United. Too. And I feel like about 500 quid. if if I if I could sell a few more bits on my gallery, I still think like Vinny Junior is a good pickup in terms of like the elite. With the he's got years left, doesn't he? He's got another yeah. two or three years, and maybe I need that. You know, like or I'd love to win a Harland. That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I can't bring that Premier League back in there. Although Harland again now, especially since he's left Dortmund, is another classic case of if he doesn't score, he doesn't score well. That's it, yeah. Like, he is only decisive heavy and nothing else. And even yeah, as good as he is and as many goals as he scored, he had a game there for City where he scored a hat-trick and finished literally on 80 points. And it's like, that's just not good enough. Like, yeah, 
you know what? On any other weekend, I do have Cherky, who is the best all round forward under 23. Um, he, he's just he's just finding his feet back in the team. But if he becomes a regular starter, he put up an all around of 30 last week, which is obscene for a forward. Um, yeah. And, you know, like when, when you get, if you watch Leon in the last few weeks, he is the creative spark in that team. If he can cement his place in the starting lineup. Yeah. That's why I'm interested in Lacazette, good. actually. Like, as an Arsenal fan, anyway, I love Lacazette. But looking at his scores since he's been at Leon and they're in bad form, his scores are good. Yeah. If they can find their form right. again. Like Lacazette, Cherky, a lot of the Leon boys could, could end up being like monster scorers. Yeah. They need to hit that form. But yeah, I watched them a couple of times. It, they're a little bit wasteful up top. Like they make a lot of chances, but they don't put many away. They need like a Patrick Schick up top or someone like that who they can just feed the ball into. Because Laka sits off, he sits like a bit of a false nine. Yeah. And and Cherky's like a Cherky's like a number ten, almost like a creative midfielder who plays through the lines. But then on the wings, they've got like Toko Ikambi. I'm not sure really how he's still in the starting lineup as often as he is. Um. And they just there's just something missing. I don't know what it is, but maybe it is just like a cold blooded, like fox in the box, like a Schick or a Veghorst or someone like that who can just put the ball in the net. But um, but they're not looking a bad side. I like Tete as well. He's a good player. He's yeah. another good one they've got there. So they've got they've got um they've got some great players, and obviously at the cent their centre backs they've got great young centre backs, um, Diamande and. Uh, the K bar, great players. So I think they're a team that can can improve. They'll be on the up over the next coming seasons. And hope if if Cherky like cements his place in that team, he'll be one of those elite U23. His price has already doubled since I picked him up and everyone was calling me an idiot for buying him. But I think people are seeing like if he can cement that place, he'll be one of them. So maybe I don't need to rush into the market just yet. But yeah, they don't because they don't have a game this weekend. I, he would have 100 percent been my yeah. favorite sign up, but yeah, that's fair. But yeah, unfortunately, this week my the fixtures haven't been too kind to me, and a lot of my forwards have found themselves rotated or just a bit out of form. So I'm hoping Peroa can nick a decisive away to QPR on the weekend. Um, they tend to score. He's normally like in amongst the goals or assists. So fingers crossed for that one because I think the rest of the lineup should be good. Um, looking forward to seeing Verts back on the pitch. Anyway, I think that's yeah. Mate. Looking forward to chasing both you guys down on the leaderboards this week. Should be a good fun one again. Definitely. And, and good luck to everyone listening. Uh, we hope you enjoy the I podcast. I disagree. Bad luck to everyone listening. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, thanks for coming, man. It's been yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah. It's been a great chat. Have you this all day? Yeah, no, you and me both, man. I, 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 I know I'm going to end here now. I'm going to go and stream and just chat about Sora again for four hours. Yep. <laughs> like... we we'll locked in, mate. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks for hanging. Cheers.